Chapter 15 of Murder Mistress by Robert Colby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 15 Just before she opened the door, Valerie had the distinct impression that the phone was ringing. She made haste, but once inside, there wasn't so much as an overtone of bell sound. She must have been mistaken. Only Clay would call, and then not unless there was an emergency. She went into the bedroom, the one she shared with Clay. For a moment she studied herself in the dresser mirror. They had done very nicely with her hair. Of course, it was set too highly, but she would comb it out and brush it thoroughly, restore that fluff which gave her such a casual look of perfection. And oh, the clothes she had bought at Burdine's. Hundreds of dollars worth. A few days for minor alterations, and Clay would be in for a surprise. Lord, it was hot. She unzipped her dress and pulled out of it. She felt sticky. A lukewarm bath with some of those sweet-smelling crystals in the tub, and she would be relaxed and fresh again. You went from air conditioning out into that hot sun, and the contrast was just too much. In the bathroom, while the tub was filling, she removed bra, panties, and stockings. Naked, she dumped a few of the crystals in the water and climbed in, readjusting the mixture for more cold. In a minute, she closed the tap and lay back, sinking under. She felt the muscular tension leave her, but the hollow, drawn feeling in her stomach remained. Fear. Ugly, ugly. Not until they left this town would it ever vanish. Not until the bank and the police and Roy were just vague little memories of an unpleasant dream. Roy. He was the one to fear. Neither the bank nor the police had the slightest chance of linking Clay with the robbery, even if they knew who committed it. There was no visible connection. But Roy, by some crude instinct, had come close to the answer of what happened to the money. And then all he had to do was accuse and read the possibilities on Clay's face. Anyway, he knew. Not how, but he knew. And he was going to get that money, whatever it cost him. Or them. She almost wished Roy was dead and there was Marty to reckon with. She had maneuvered Marty once and might have been able to do it again. He sounded and acted tough, but he had a soft spot for the right woman. Didn't she know? In Roy, she had read pure animal lechery. But in Marty, the lechery had been mingled with respect and a little core of something you might call love if you understood his capacity. All she had to do was play up to him on Clay's advice. Nothing open, just a hint in the eye, a brush against him, an innuendo of conversation. Next thing you know, Roy had gone and Marty was on the phone. He had something to say to her. Would she come over? And then he was pleading with her to skip with him, showing her the lure of that tan suitcase full of money, explaining the plan, and she was asking a few very indirect questions and getting direct answers while stalling. She couldn't go with him now because there were loose ends. She had given Clay her share of the money and had to get it back. Also, she was too kind-hearted. She wanted to let him down easy, not just disappear. She would fly to the coast and meet Marty as soon as she got his letter, and, no, dear, not now, save that for later when the strain is office but she permitted him a few quick caresses to allay his suspicion. And, what time are you leaving, Marty, in case I should change my mind? Then she took back to Clay the entire scheme, route and all. Suddenly she sat up in the tub and listened. It was the second time she thought she heard knocking. For some silly reason, you hardly ever found a home down here with a doorbell. People had to break their hands to get your attention. She heard the sound again. Oh, well, probably some salesman. She sank back and began to soap herself. Clay had been terribly angry about the split in the first place. He should get a full fifty percent, because without his information there would be no robbery, no knowledge of the half-million and exact moment of its arrival. But he was over a barrel. He had to pay back the sixty-two thousand in fake loans. That left him only thirty-eight, not counting her twenty-five thousand. Which was strictly hers. Strictly and Clay wanted to use Valerie to find out what Marty and Roy were doing with all that money. His mind was already at work. Then, when he got a picture of Marty traveling alone with the money, he came up with a perfectly marvelous, almost foolproof idea to take it away from him, without his knowing how it was done, if he lived, and Roy just as much in the dark. What Clay did was to steal a car that couldn't be identified by Marty, a car that wouldn't even be missed. The car was in the garage of the big house, and the people were gone. Clay told the locksmith he had lost his keys, and the man made two complete sets. Then together they drove the Cadillac to Marty's. Waiting in the darkness, they watched him leave.
They took another route for a while, a shortcut, and got ahead of him. It was easy to figure his approximate traveling time since he wouldn't dare run a mile over the speed limit. Out in the open country of the Everglades, they waited on a side road. As they waited, there was a brief torrential downpour which must have delayed Marty, for he was later than expected, but eventually the familiar cream and red olds flashed by. They gave it time, then pulled back on the highway and caught up. Marty was doing exactly sixty. They passed, Valerie on the floor, Clay with a hat pulled down on his head. Just a precaution. It was too dark to identify anyone. They sped on ahead for a little over half an hour at eighty, figuring Marty to be just a few minutes behind. They came to the gas station joint, and Clay let Valerie walk from the intersection over to it as, out of sight, he swung around. She was to wait twenty minutes, though it shouldn't take over ten since both cars would be speeding towards each other. Then she was to figure on trouble and take the bus or any other transportation she could get back to the house. Originally, she was to be in the car for the wrecking of Marty so that she could drive down the road and circle back while Clay got the money, assisting him in any way possible. But waiting for Marty in the rain, Clay changed his mind. Though he was an excellent driver and had the element of surprise in his favor, bad luck might befall him, just as it did. Valerie could have been hurt. And now, when all was done and the danger should have passed, it might be just beginning again. Valerie got out of the tub and slowly dried herself. She had just covered her nakedness with a negligee, when over the gurgle of the drain she heard muted splintering of glass. It sounded like it came from the rear of the house. At the same time, the phone began to ring. Frantic, she didn't know which way to run, but she had to determine the cause of that sound. She went to the back door just as Roy Whalen came smirking towards her from the kitchen. Distantly, the phone rang on and on. "'Don't you ever answer a knock?' said Roy, following as she backed off, not for a moment missing the way her body must be revealed through the flimsy dressing gown. "'Are you crazy?' she cried. "'Did you have to break a window?' "'Would you have opened the door, sweetheart?' She could only stare at him, seeing in the glacial brightness of his eyes nothing but sensual cruelty. The phone, with a final angry trill, stopped ringing. "'What do you want, Roy? What do you think?' "'You're wasting your time. You can talk with Clay. He'll be here any minute now,' she lied. "'Until then, please get out. Make me.' His hand dropped on her shoulder, his fingers kneading her flesh. Fear clutched and paralyzed her. Fingers sought the neck of the gown and slid under. "'Don't, Roy, please.' "'I can't hear you,' he was thoughtful. "'Don't you think,' he mused, "'that I'm in a unique position. "'How many guys ever had it so good? "'Because what could you do? "'Call the police?' he snickered. "'No, don't run. "'You wouldn't get three steps.' With a quick downslice of his finger, he caught the sash and applied pressure until it came undone. The gown opened. That's the trouble, Valerie. On this side of the law, where can you turn? Except to one of us. Clay? Don't kid me. I give him a couple of hours yet. Marty's dead. So that leaves just you and me, baby, all by ourselves. You wouldn't enjoy it, Roy. I'd fight you every step. Strangely, if she wasn't so frightened, she might have enjoyed it herself. For every now and then, she became curious about these physical types within whom whirled a dynamo of force, silent and unseen, but charging the air with a feeling of stored energy. That's where you're wrong, said Roy. I'd get a boot out of taking it from you. On the other hand, be smart. Cooperation would be safer, much safer. I could get carried away. She saw instantly that he was right. A hideous idea was defining itself in her mind. Is this what you came for, Roy? It was an afterthought, he said, but it kept growing on me. He smiled, a humorless twist of the lips. So it must have been there all the time. He ran his hand along her thigh. I came for two things. One of them was the money. But I'll get both of them, Valerie if I have to kill you to do it. He meant it. There was no room for doubt in the set of his jaw. Of course, the money would be more difficult, resting as it was in a half-dozen safety deposit boxes around Palm Beach. But looking in the mirror of Roy's eyes, she saw herself producing the keys, and then the ride in his car to some motel. And in the morning, Roy waiting behind her as she signed, opened boxes, delivered. 
all the signatures hers, since Clay had not dared show himself, and all the policemen in their cars and on the streets beyond calling. I should really attend to business first, Roy continued. Business before pleasure. But somehow I can't seem to concentrate. Isn't that a funny one? Then hurry, said Valerie. You're driving me insane. She choked a sob. Insane with passion, said Roy. Just can't wait for me, baby, is that it? He wrenched the gown off her shoulders. It slithered to the floor. God damn, God damn now, he whistled. What I've been missing all these years, man, oh man. She turned her back on him and walked slowly towards the bedroom, knowing he'd follow. Jesus, said Roy as he closed the door. Right in your own little nest, you and your lover boy. Ain't that sacrilegious? She pulled down the cover and got between the sheets. Then she waited, turning her head as he began to undress. It was in those moments when he was most oblivious that her hand sneaked over to the night table and slowly eased back the drawer. The steel bulk of the forty-five seemed immense, and so much heavier than when Clay showed her its operation, saying, Now if that bastard comes looking for trouble while I'm gone, don't let him get near you. He's dangerous, and you wouldn't have a chance with him, Val. I mean that. Now, this is fully loaded, safety off. You pull this hammer back, and then all you do is squeeze the trigger. She understood this, but only in a vague sense, the awful power and dreadful finality in the use of such a weapon. As she lifted the pistol in her hand, thumbing back the hammer, it occurred to her that she might merely threaten him. But she saw with certainty that one way or another, the gun would change hands. She turned towards him and brought the barrel of the gun an inch above the top center of his head. Then... She squeezed the trigger. She had a confused multi-impression of pistol jerking upward in hand, an explosion of terrifying depth and reverberation, the smell of cordite, and finally the small incongruous sigh as Roy Whalen exhaled his last breath. Her next impression was of a sight so shocking that it would be engraved upon her subconscious, ready to leap into unwelcome view the rest of her days, for the bullet had gone through the top of his head, and thundered on to blast away his lower jaw. With a tortured moan, she turned her head, and the weight of the gun, no longer sustained, carried her hand to rest across his shoulder. The feeling of his flesh was revolting, and she snapped her hand away, allowing the weapon to sink to the bed. With her back to him, feet on the floor, she sat doubled over, weeping. The phone on the table came into misty vision, and she reached for it, lifting the receiver. Her hand trembled so badly that she misdialed and had to try again. Finally, she got the bank, and then Clay. Come home, she sobbed. Come home. I don't care how it will look. She screamed hysterically. You've got to! You've got to! Then she hung up and sat staring at the receiver with its finger smear of blood. End of chapter 15